everyone. This is the Crime Cafe, your podcasting source of great crime, suspense, and thriller writing. I'm your host, Debbie Mack. Before I introduce our guest, let me remind you that the Crime Cafe nine book set and the Crime Cafe anthology are both on sale online at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Kobo, and all the usual suspects in terms of online book shopping. You can find all the links on my website, debbiemack.com. So check them out, please. And with that said, I'd like to introduce my guest, the author of a very, shall we say, surreal thriller, uh, Paul Cassell. Hey, Paul, thanks for joining us today. I'm glad you were able to make it onto the show. Hi, Debbie. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm very pleased to have you. Um, Tell us about the Bedfellows series books. I was just talking to Paul before the show and telling him that I'm reading If the Bed Falls In, and it's pretty mind-blowing. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little about the books in general. The, where the books come, the, 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 uh, the plan is, is that this will be a series of five thrillers. The first two are written and published, and I'm currently working on the third. The idea came from um, my interest over the last few years in what's, what, the he- what the heck is happening in this world, economically and socially, what's going on. And I started researching, looking into, um, the, you know, they always say in, in, in crime, follow the money. So I started following the money. And what I discovered about, uh, about global economics and banks um, and shadow government, I started learning some really, really scary stuff. And that's what led me to, to, to start writing the Bedfellows series. Um, because it's looking at, it's using that as a backdrop. What is, what I believe is really happening. And there's some really quite hairy, scary stuff happening. Um, and it ain't over yet. Um, and, uh, and I wanted to, to put that into, uh, into an exciting story that so people could be entertained by it as well as hearing some ideas about what might actually be, be going on. So that was the idea. Wow. Um, do you have a background in either of the two main characters' careers, or did you rely entirely on research? Okay. Good question. Good question. Well, it is true. I've never worked for MI6. This is true. This is true. Um, however, I like John Macare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. He did. Um, as did Ian Fleming. Yeah. That's great. Um, but. Um, uh, no, but I was a photographer. I st- my, my father was a photographer. He was a, a weddings and babies man. Um, I started when I was 60 or no, 17. I actually went to sea and worked on cruise ships as a photographer. Um, I had my 18th birthday on my, on the, my first cruise in Casablanca. That was, a uh, was some time ago, but, uh, that was, that was interesting. So yeah, photography, I've, I've worked a lot in photography and in, in process photography, it used to be for computers. You know, it was all the all the publishing side of photography as well, all the all the technical side. So yeah, so like one of the characters, Tom, I was in photography, which I, I'm sure influ- influenced my cho- choice of his profession. I guess. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, I read in one of your other interviews that you have an interest in quantum physics and the nature of reality. Absolutely. Absolutely. You've been doing your research, Debbie, haven't you? Eh? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I find those uh, subjects fascinating. Uh, where did you, how did you develop these interests? And do you have um, expertise or, or I'm, I'm very, on those uh, subjects that you'd like to share? Well, I'm, I'm very much a lady scientist. I've, I've always been really interested in science. And uh, an unusual mix of uh, I've always been very creative, as I as I told you before the the interview. The viewers may be interested that I spent a lot of my life as an actor before I I turned to uh, I started taking up writing full time and so on. Um, and um, so I've always been very creative, but really interested. I'm very practical. I, you know, I have a you know, I'm quite good at doing things practically, and um, and I really enjoy that sort of thing. And I also have this. I'm driven to find out you know, what is behind stuff, what's really going on. Um, and the nature of reality is the biggest, the biggest what's really going on there is. So I'm 
I'm really drawn to that, and I've written lots of short stories and things around the, the nature of reality. And even the first book in this series, If the Bed Falls In, starts off with a psychological thriller. Who am I really? Is the character. You know, so you, know, you can see that's a, a theme of my of my 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 writing. I'm I'm fascinated, fascinated by by yeah, what 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 is this really about? And um, maybe interesting that one of my conclusions is is that I am now almost firmly of the opinion that what we see as reality isn't actually real, that it's our perception of the energy and the consciousness that, that exists, but how we perceive it is not how it really is. And, uh, and that matter is actually a perception, not, not a reality, so. Wow, that's yeah. really interesting stuff because <laughs> when I was in college, I took a cosmology course Ah. And I was actually at one time interested in going into physics. Mm. But was sort of done in by the math, but I've always been fascinated by science myself. Have you ever yeah. thought of writing science fiction? I, yes, yes, I have. I have a book that's that it's a, a short, it's a sort of a long short story, or maybe a novella, um, which which is currently called um, currently called the Unforgiving Minute. A quote from uh, Kipling's uh, poem "If," um, and that's about that's about uh, time travel. It's about time travel and traveling between between universes. That sound that sounds that sounds misleading. If you knew what the story actually, if you read the actual story, I haven't finished it. About halfway through, three quarters of the way through, it was shelved some time ago, and I need to come back to it. But it's you know, it, I, I'm fascinated by as I say by by the, all those the, the, the ideas of that reality and so. On. So um, I've lost track of what the question was. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> now I've lost track. You're interested, what... about physics. <laughs> you're interested uh, in physics and uh, the nature of reality. I had uh, studied cosmology and you mentioned uh, right. oh, science fiction. That's right. Science, I've written science fiction. So yes, brilliant. Yes. So, so uh, that is definitely science fiction. Yes. Um, there's a science fiction element to to you know an element to sub to many of the things I write, and my 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 the, the main thing I'm working up to is a book that I started a few years ago, and I haven't touched it for a while because it's just too big a project for me. It's a book called uh, simply called Being, and it is very much about the nature of reality. Um, I can't say too much about it really, um, but if it if I can. If I can complete this book, it will be a fascinating work. It really will, because it's just it reaches the places that I've I've never I've never come come across a book that tries to reach to the places I'm trying to reach to in this novel. It's a novel that is fiction, but it just it just digs so deeply into the fabric of um, of reality um, and religion and creationism. Um, I'm not religious. I'm not a creationist. Mm -hmm. um, but it digs into into the whole thing of you know the 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 the, the patternicity the way the way we are creatures that look for patterns in things that's how we that's how we survive we look for patterns and then we put things together and of course that also leads to superstition so it can mislead us as well and I think so much of our of our patternistic brain has misled has, has misled us into into many things and you know I don't want to be offensive but for me. Um, religion, a lot, not all, but a lot of the tenets of religion, for me, are misguided patternicity. It's got us into believing superstitions that are just superstitious. They just don't have any real bearing in what's going on. So I don't wish to be offensive. I don't afraid a religious person not to be religious. It helps them. But for me, it just doesn't work. Well, personally, um, yeah. I, I hate it when people use religion as an excuse for violence. Exactly. It's one thing that I don't like. Yeah, um, yeah. And we've seen a bit of that recently, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, without revealing spoilers, can you talk generally about where you plan to go with the arc of the Bedfellows series? Yeah, certainly, certainly. A bit <laughs> of plugging going on here. So, so here's book one, If the Bed Falls In, right, which is... The, the, as I started to write these, I had the idea 
to actually write them as different genres. So this first book, as you're, uh, you're, you're reading at the moment, I believe you're uh, chapter 10 or something, mm -hmm. um, this is a psychological thriller, right? Book two, which is this one, which is As Mad As Hell, and you may be able to oh, catch that looks familiar. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly, The Twin Towers. Very a big, big part of, of this book as we get into the real, real conspiracy theories and so on. This is much more a sort of Mission Impossible style. So there's a whole big uh, sort of getting together with a whole, a whole group of people to try and do a Mission Impossible style reveal on somebody to find out the information they want to find out. Um, book three become, is, is much more a sort of, um, uh, a sort of Da Vinci Code type. <laughs> but so but what better written. Sorry? But much better written. <laughs> well, I don't think Dan Brown raised the bar very high on that score. And <laughs> great storyteller. But, mm. yes. <laughs> some writing classes. Um, certainly not marketing classes. I wish I had his marketing prowess. Um, so, but yeah, much more that style. It's much more about, you know, the, the mysterious parts, you know, the um, there's a there's a woman who used to work, I believe, for the IMF, for the the, the International Monetary Fund, uh, Karen Hudis. Some of your viewers may 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 have heard of her, and she is a, she was a, an attorney with the IMF. She's a very very you know, solid person, very very well educated, um, experienced person, and she was fired because she was whistleblowing, and there's a big court case and so on, and she believes completely. That there is a second species of human being on the planet. I can't remember what she calls them. I will be researching that for, for, the, for the third book. But she believes that, that they are they they actually look like us, except they have domed heads, high domed heads, which is and the and they are they are mostly uh, Jesuits uh, at the Vatican, which is why. Um, why the, uh, the people at the Vatican, the people, you know, the, 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 uh, the bishops and so on and cardinals and so on, wear the big high hats to hide, hide the domed heads. Now, you may think, yeah, when are the men in, you know, in white jackets coming to take this woman away? But you hear her talk and she talks very seriously about, about finance and monetary policy and international politics. And that seems fine. And she also weaves in this stuff about these people and how the Jesuits these this this are this different race of human beings and they're and they're enslaving us and so on and you think hang on a minute this is this is really spooky stuff you know and so the third book will be much more it won't be getting into it quite as much as Carrie Hudis does but it will be touching on that sort of Da Vinci Code stuff you know the hidden meanings behind things the Illuminati um, you know all of that sort of you know the, 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 uh, the Freemasons all that sort of stuff. So that's the style of the third book. Uh, the fourth book is um, will be. Um, I'm not as clear on the exact genre, but but the um, the fourth book is is really sort of um, it's leading up to the it's crisis. So I don't know what genre it is exactly yet, but it's crisis. You know the what a lot of financial. Um, uh, commentators and myself believe is that we are heading to a really big economic crash. That's you know we're talking serious, serious crash. All currencies will become worthless. Um, you know, you know the, the, the countries are just going to be in civil war across the globe. Um, the the, the you know, what 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 may what may be coming is unprecedented in in human history, and it's possible. It's not inevitable, and it'd be wonderful if it didn't happen. But I and many people much, much better educated than me and much more experienced than me believe that's what we're facing. Um, so the fourth book is, um, is imagining that. And then the fifth book is post-apocalyptic. It's after the big crash and how society is picking itself back up. But of course, the main characters of, of, of my book are right the way through, will be there right the way through. So everything's seen from their perspective. Wow. So that's well, it. it. Sounds, sounds good, sober. doesn't it? Yes, it yeah, does I, sound good. I almost wish I hadn't written them so I could read them myself. <laughs> uh, well, I'm looking forward to them because definitely I'm enjoying your first one. 
in mm. the series. I shouldn't say your first one because your first one was Conversations with Eric. That was your first um, book, correct? That was my first novel, yeah. Was I was uh, intrigued that you call it a comic thriller. I've never read, I don't think, a comic thriller unless The Hitchhiker's thriller. Guide counts as a comic thriller. <laughs> well, it does really, doesn't it? It's not, it does it's not in quite, a sense. <laughs> yeah, not, quite, not, not quite as wacky as, as, as uh, Douglas Adams' book, but... Um, <laughs> But uh, who I love, I love, I love Douglas Adams. Um, it's a problem of writers. It's so it's it's so hard not to plagiarize when you're when you're a writer because you you love other people's work so much and you so much want to you know want to do the same Even. as them. <laughs> you can so you know so easily accidentally write something that's a, that's a complete rip off without realizing. It's like musicians, isn't it? You know, you know they 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 hear a tune in their head and they're going. Have I heard this somewhere, or did I just? <laughs> what could it be? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, conversations with Eric. I call it a a, a crime comedy uh, for those that take their humour seriously. I love yeah. that description. Yeah. yeah, it's a it's a it's a, it's a it's a serious comedy. What I wanted, I was inspired by a number of things. One, John Irving's book and film, uh, um, The World According to Garp. Oh yeah, good movie. And it's wonderful stuff. Wonderful stuff. You know, with the with the late great Robin Williams, um, and um, a film I absolutely adore. In fact, in fact, ever since I saw the film, I've said that um, I, 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 mean, I am in a relationship now. But um, I've always said some, from that film when I haven't been in a relationship that if I meet someone, I have to show them the world according to the Garp, the film, the world according to Garp, and if they enjoy it. I can be with them, and if they don't, I need to carry on looking. Because I can't, <laughs> I can't be with anyone that doesn't find The World of to Garp a wonderful film, a touching, wonderful movie. So anyway, so I was very inspired by that. Also inspired, uh, inspired by, um, I'm trying to think of his name. I think his surname's Gail. Uh, he wrote uh, Back to the Future. Oh, huh. Um, I think his surname's Gail. Can't think of his I can't think of his full name at the moment. But he wrote a wonderful film called Interstate 60. I've never seen know. it. Interstate 60. I recommend that everybody goes out and looks for Interstate 60. This is the guy that wrote Back to the Future, amongst other things. So he's huh. a good writer. He's a good writer. Bob Gale. I've just remembered. Bob Gale, I believe. Um, Interstate 60 is wonderful. It has the wackiness of, um, of Back to the Future. Uh, but it it digs down really deep. It's a farce. It's massively farcical. It's crazy, but it digs down deep into into the human, you know, into the human soul. What we're like and what we care about, and how how crazy we are, and how we 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 don't you know we don't face things, and which, which is why we don't achieve things. And it's it's a wonderful study of human nature, but it's done as a road movie. And I. I wanted, I so wanted to do this road movie like that. I wanted to do what Bob Gale did. And I wanted this road movie that, that traveled all over the place. Loads of different characters keep on coming in and leaving and coming in and leaving. Um, and it really, and it was farcical and crazy and desperately funny, but also just took your breath away with, with how you just, you know, you, people watching it would go, oh my God, that's right. Yeah, I know, they, I know what you mean, yeah. And that's what I tried to do with Eric, um, and um, and the feedback is is it has been fantastic on that. Um, wow. So many people, including um, you know the uh, is it the um, is it the Hungry Monster um, book review? Um, I think it's the Hungry Monster they're called book review, and a number of other things, online book review. So many, so many of these people, as well as, as, well as all, you know, just ordinary readers, have said, this is the most unusual book I've ever read. Hmm. You know, they just like, what? I was not expecting this. This is so weird, but I rather like it. So, but it is, it is laugh out loud. I mean, one, one, one review said, uh, warning, you know, uh, and uh, do not read this in public places because you will laugh out loud spontaneously. <laughs> um, so I'm very, very proud of that book, especially as Eric, Eric is the, is the Labrador that belongs to the the, uh, the main guy, Simon. Um, it's a yellow lab. That was my lab. He was my Labrador um, uh, called Eric. And he died this last March. 
uh, nearly 15 years old, my oh boy. My goodness. Yeah, so I'm, I, I've just turned 57. I can't believe it. I've just turned 57. <laughs> so 15 years is, as I reckon it, more than a quarter of my life I was with Eric. We were together. That's, that's a long time, isn't it? Yes. We saw each other through a lot of stuff, a heck of a lot of stuff. And I'm so pleased. I was worried that I wouldn't finish the book before he died. But I did. I finished it a long way before he died, you know, more than a year before he died. But then he died. And I'm glad Aww. it's there. So at least my, 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 my crazy, crazy Labrador is, uh, is immortalized in there. That's awesome. In the of Eric. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Um, well, as you pointed out, you're not originally from Spain. And that is where you live, this correct? True. This is true. Originally from England, from London, born in London. Oh, London. Yeah. Yeah, uh, north and north, uh, north and east London. Uh, grew up in Essex, in Harlow, in Essex, for people that know England, uh, south, southern England, um, and uh, and then lived in uh, in Hertfordshire, which is one of the one of the counties um, adjoining London, um, just north of London. Um, before I met my partner, who is English. But she's a Spanish translator and she's been living in Spain for over 20 years. And she lives here in Spain with her two Spanish children who, and though she may, she, she may be interested in coming back to England, um, unfortunately at the moment their father is Spanish and obviously won't let, them out of the, won't let the kids out of the country. So for, the, for now, for the time being, <laughs> this is home, Spain. <laughs> so, um, so that's why I came out here. And um, it's an interesting, interesting life. Suddenly, at the age of fifty-seven, having two teenage children. Very yes, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, a challenge, one might say. <laughs> um, <laughs> do you ever miss England? In some ways, yes. I, what I mainly miss is my my Spanish isn't very good, and mm. I'm not bad in languages. I don't speak any languages, any other languages fluently, but I've I've always dabbled in languages. Um, uh, um, but no, I don't have, I don't even have conversational Spanish. Um, and I, I, I don't really have mental space to, 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 to think about it, to work on it because all my time is spent either writing or marketing. Marketing when you're a self-published author is massive. It takes up so much time and so much energy. And then to be trying to learn Spanish as well, which, you know, I could organize my life in a different way, but one has to pri prioritize according to you know where one's going and at the moment the important thing is to is to write as much as i can and to get my books out there to market to get people reading them um, because when people read them they really love them but of course if people don't know about them exactly. they're not gonna read them. yeah so hence you know wonderful people like yourself doing these sort of things really helps promote writers like me which is brilliant excellent well, it's a pleasure for me as well, because it's wonderful to meet other authors this way and talk about their work and, and learn yeah. about it. And um, uh, let me ask you another question about the acting. I've noticed yeah. that when I'm writing, sometimes I will put myself in the head of a character, much in the method, like, like a method actor almost, yeah. sort of living that person and thinking about what they would say as if I were doing it. Do you yeah. find acting skills help you as a writer? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I sit here. This, this, this. You can't see much of it, but this is actually. Um, I call this my my windowless hole. This is actually the only room that I found where I could write in here at our house. It's actually a small. It's a large storage. Well, it's a, it's a medium sized storage room, off of the garage. I'm actually down in the basement off the garage, and it's windowless, and there's a big steel door. That's all it is, and no windows, and it's it's not very nice, and it's quite small, but it's it's home to me. And um, what well, we just subscribed, I get so my mind is so tangential. You were asking me about ah oh, acting out. Acting. Yes, I sit down here, and yes, absolutely, I sit here because it's and I'm isolated to everybody else, and I completely play out the scenes in my head. You know, there's um there's a scene. I, I'm not going to say which book it's in or anything. It's just a, a character who believes it, because I don't want to give any spoilers away, but there's a character who believes his wife is dead 
and suddenly she turns up. And I'm faced with this scene, writing this scene, and I'm there as this character, and I put myself in the position of this character, standing there, and this woman just walks in. And, and I thought, what would I feel? I don't want to intellectually think about what I'd feel. I just put myself in that situation as an actor doing an improvisation and say, okay, and scene, go for it. Exactly. Start action. And then I act, and as I'm feeling it and emoting and crying and getting angry, I'm writing it down. You know? Exactly, yeah. exactly. So absolutely. You do this as well. Oh, yeah, definitely. Most definitely. I always kind of picture the whole thing. And um, I've, I've been doing screenwriting as well. So mm. it kind of getting to know actors and uh, understanding some of that really helps me. Yeah. So, yeah, um, absolutely. Absolutely. I used to, years ago, there was a, a, a comedy on British television. Um, I can't remember what it's called. But the, the main character was, a, was a, a father and he had two, uh, two or three teenage children that he was bringing up by himself. I can't remember why, I can't remember after the wife. But he was a crime writer. And he would often sit there in his study acting things out. So the kids would walk in and he was in some sort of contortion on the floor, you know, with a <laughs> knife in one hand and a candlestick in the other. <laughs> and he was that obviously trying weird. something out, trying to work it out. And, I, you know, I, I, I understand why. I understand why. Oh, that you sounds know, fantastic. I'd, I'd love to see that one. <laughs> <laughs> We're probably that was that was back when I was a kid. We're probably talking about forty, more than forty years ago. I'm oh. sure it, it wouldn't play very well now. It'd probably be very very staid and old fashioned now. Well, I don't know. Doctor Who has been revived. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure about the, the original ones. I have a, a reader in England who I met when I was actually in England, who lives in, uh, in Brentwood, who uh, might uh, yeah. know, know more about this, <laughs> whose name is Absolutely. also Paul, actually, uh, also, ironically are, enough, or something. There are a few of us. <laughs> <laughs> Paul is a popular name my, in England. My, my stepson here is also Paul. His name is Pablo. Pablo is Spanish. Pablo. Si, si, Pablo. Pablo. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add before we finish up? Um, just that I am making a special offer on your on your channel here. That there's a there's a a, a link I believe you're supplying. Is that right? You're supplying a, a hyperlink to hyperlinks for me. That I I can certainly put that on the um the, the blog where I put up our video. Yeah. Okay. So uh, anybody that wants to click on that, there's one link that will take you to a free copy of If the Bed Falls In, the first in the in the series that Deb is reading at the moment. Uh, so you can actually get this free, obviously not a paperback, but uh, the, you know, a Kindle copy, or in fact, you know, any of the formats. It takes you through to a, a, a site where you can actually get the book in electronic form in any, um, in any format that you need. So you can get that for free. Um, it does require you to sign, sign up to my list, in which case I'll be sending you, you know, other emails, one or two, one or, you know, maybe an email a week or every couple of weeks talking about other things that I'm doing and other, other offers available. But it will get you the free book and it's worth it. For free, you can complain. Um, and the other link takes you through to Amazon where you can get the free copy of my non-fiction work, um, New World Order, No Way Out, which is the factual background of this uh, banking conspiracy that many people will talk about. New World Order, Illuminati, Freemasonry, all this sort of stuff. And it's the factual background. It's a short book, 11 and a half thousand words, and that's free on Amazon. You can either go straight to Amazon or you can use the link that Debbie will supply. Um, and and that's, that's free as well. Uh, no sign up for that. You just get that direct from Amazon. And that will give you the background to these books, as well as being a very illuminating um, uh, piece of work on, uh, on what may actually be happening in this world at the moment. Wow. Well, I have got to check that one out for sure. Please, please Thank do. you so much for mentioning that. And um, with that, I will just say thank you again for being here, Paul. It was a pleasure having you on. Yeah, it's been it's been a been a joy, been a joy, really, really. It's been lovely. Thank you. Same here. <laughs> I've had a wonderful time. Excellent. Excellent. And um, with that, I will just remind you also that. You can get your copy of the Crime Cafe Nine Book Set and Crime Cafe Anthology online at all the usual suspects in terms of online retail. 
but you can find all the links at my website, debbiemack.com. And with that, I will say thanks for listening and see you in two weeks.